splendor of the King. Clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, and trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great. Beginning and the end, the beginning and the end. The God of three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. Just stand and sing with us. How great How is our great God. Is our God. Sing Welcome to worship this morning. We got the temperature set to keep you wide awake this morning with us in worship. I'm going to continue leading us into worship out of the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 5. And this is written when all hell was breaking loose. Literally, all hell was breaking loose. And there was a glimpse into the throne room of what is true all the time. So as we sing how great God is, there's singing going on all the time. So listen to this scripture and let it lead us into worship. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne. And the living creatures and the elders, they numbered myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. And they were singing with full voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slaughtered to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them singing to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And all said, Amen. We stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He And together we sing Holy is the Lord Lord, God Almighty, the earth is 
to a time of prayer of confession, I want to frame our prayer of confession with Psalm 25. Here are these first few verses of Psalm 25 as we enter into a time of prayer of confession. It says this, it says, in you, Lord my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame. So as we enter into this time of prayer of confession, maybe we remember at this baptismal font the trust in this relationship we entered into with God, that in life with God, no one will ever be able to put us to shame as a result of this relationship we have with God. So let's bow our heads and enter into a time of prayer of confession, beginning with the time of silent prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for you and we thank you for the trust that we have in you. And perhaps in this prayer of confession, we really just need to pray to you that we may not be put to shame, that we live in a world that might laugh at us for our faith or our trust that we have in you. They may mock it. And so in this time of prayer of confession, God, we just confess that we want to remember our baptism Remember the vows that were made whenever we made them. If we were an infant, if we were an adult, that we have been captured by love with you, God, in the baptismal font. Never let us be put to shame, but may we ever trust in you, now and always, God. Take away all of our sins and our blemishes and guide us in the path everlasting, God, that we might know you all the more every day of our life. Lord, hear our prayers of confession and may you receive them from us and set us on the path that you would have for us. We pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 
hear these words again from Psalm 25, a few verses later, that says this, Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from old. Do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you, Lord, are good. Brothers and sisters, I declare to you in the name of God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit that your sins are forgiven in Jesus Christ and that God loves you and that you have this trusting relationship with the Lord. God is good. Amen. If you're able, you can rise and body your spirit and we'll sing about the goodness of God. Let's continue to worship. to heal me. I am weak. I need your love to free me. Oh Lord, my rock, my strength in weakness, come rescue me. of Christ be with you. At Trinity, we like to pass the peace of Christ with those around us. So introduce yourself to someone and just say, peace of Christ be with you. And you respond? All right, let's do that. Let's pass the peace of Christ. And children, kindergarten through eighth grade are dismissed down to their classes. Children, kindergarten through eighth grade are dismissed down to their classes. All right. Well, we have been in this worship series on the Gospel of Mark, and... For those of you who read the email blast, this has been so much fun for me. I am just loving the Gospel of Mark. I hope you are too. And these opportunity to just learn more about what Jesus is up to in this Gospel, it's been wonderful. So today we're looking at the very end of Mark chapter 5. So if you'd like to, you can open up the Pew Bibles in front of you. You can follow along on the screens. It's verses 21 through 43. And as you'll recall, last week, Jesus was doing some ministry in the land of the Gerasenes, and then he got back on a boat to go back into Galilee. And that's where we pick up now Jesus' return into Galilee. So listen to God's word. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him. 
And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had. And she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately, her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and he said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, get up. And immediately, the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. This is the gift of God's word. Join me in a word of prayer. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So my wife and I have been uh, working on potty training with our daughter lately. I'm saying this slightly quietly because she might hear on the speakers down in the nursery right now. So this is between us, okay, in the sanctuary. <laughs> this is between us. And we're using this technique. It's called elimination communication. I don't know if any of you have heard of this. It's called elimination. The idea is that as a body is developing and learning and growing, you can begin to see the signs of what's happening and you can make sign language to match. And then you help them learn how to use the potty early on. It's amazing. Um, it's been an incredible journey. And one of, the, one of the tools that we've used is my new favorite book. It's called Potty by Leslie Patricelli. And I want to read it to you all now, okay? <laughs> We're going to read this book, all right? Danny's got it on the screens. And if you'd like to follow along, I have to go potty. I could go in my diaper. Should I go in my diaper? I don't want to. What does the kitty do? Oh. What does the doggy do? Oh. I really have to go. Um, should I go in my potty? I could try. I could try. <gasps> bye bye, diaper. <gasps> What's that? Tinkle, tinkle, toot. I did it. Hooray. Undies. 
Thank you for humoring me with that book. I love that book. <laughs> Let me tell you why I love this book so much. I love this book so much. I've read it a uh, hundred times, maybe 300 times now. <laughs> its brevity is wonderful, but it explains a journey, doesn't it, in 18 pages of perhaps if you might look at this pulpit and think about a world in which one uses diapers, and then there's this beautiful transition into a new world of potty over here represented by the baptismal font, right? Like, <laughs> profound change has taken place between that of of diaper world, and now we get to live into this new world of potty. Oh, this wonderful world of potty. I love this book, and I love just the transition and the journey between these two ideas. It's so profound. I've been trying to find a way to capture what um, philosophers of science talk about as a paradigm shift. Have you ever heard this idea? So philosophers of science talk about this thing called paradigm shift, which means that you have a worldview of certain kind of theories that explain the world around you that you can interact with. And so philosophers of science will talk about like Newton's physics is a worldview. This is a theory in a way in which to understand the world around you and bodies in motion, and we have theories to explain these kinds of things if you're living in this world. But if you're introduced to Einstein's physics, it's like unbelievable. You can't even imagine how to get to Einstein's physics when you're in Newton's worldview. It looks like there's this big canyon between this world and that world. How would you ever get to Einstein's world just through thinking your way through it? Yet, Einstein has something of like a revelatory moment in which things become made aware to him. And now he can look back at Newton and go, oh yeah, I see those steps between there to here and how some of those things still make sense for large bodies in motion. But here in this world, I have, a, I have a different kind of theoretical mindset or framework to understand the world from. And instead of seeing a, a chasm, I see a bridge. I can see steps that get me here. And I think this is the same idea with diapers and potty. <laughs> when, you, when you are trying so desperately as a parent to get over to that wonderful world over there, all you see is a canyon in front of you. <laughs> you may have theories, you may have ideas, you may have steps that you wish that could get you over there, but it's just a, it's a vague thing that takes place somewhere off in the distance in the future. You don't know how to get there necessarily. Yet, when you find yourself here, you can look back and go, oh yeah, that happened, and that happened, and that happened, and that happened, and here we are now in the promised land of potty. This, what I'm trying to explain through these examples, is, a, is really a conversion experience. A conversion experience from one reality to a new reality. And there's powerful conversion experiences that happen in the Gospel of Mark in these stories, from one place to another place. There's a profound journey as Jesus is doing his ministry when he gets back into Galilee. And it's framed around these two stories. When Jesus gets into Galilee, Jairus, who is a leader in the synagogue, he, he might be almost an equal, seen as an equal of Jesus's when he gets there. They're both leaders in the synagogue. And he comes to Jesus and he throws himself on the floor in front of Jesus and says, my little girl is sick. She's 12 years old. Will you please come and heal her? And Jesus accepts this mission to go and heal this little 12-year-old girl. On their way, they begin to go to Jairus' house and this massive crowd of people has gathered around Jesus, and, and from within the crowd, there is a sick woman, a hemorrhaging woman. She's been hemorrhaging blood for 12 years, 12 years. And the scriptures give even more details. She, she sought out doctors, physicians, healers to try to help her. No one's been able to help her. In her process of trying to get help, she's spent all of her money. She doesn't have any money anymore. And from within the crowd, she just says, if I can just but touch, touch Jesus' clothes, I will be made well. And she reaches out through the crowd and touches Jesus. And then there's this funny interaction between Jesus and the disciples, where Jesus said, somebody touched me. And the disciples say, how would you even know? There's so many people around you. It's like yesterday, if you were at the garage sale at the church, if you bumped into somebody and you said, who bumped into me? And they say, how would you even know? There's so many people around here. You would never know who bumped into you, right? So when he's in this massive crowd, and uh, the woman comes forth anyways to Jesus, and the scripture says she tells him the whole truth about what happened. 
And Jesus says the most beautiful words to this woman. He says, daughter, your faith has made you well. These are such amazing and profound words. In the first century, it was a world built upon ideas of honor and status. So when Jairus comes to meet Jesus, Jairus can make this request of Jesus to heal his daughter because of first century honor code. Only people of equal status could make this kind of request of someone, but a woman who's been hemorrhaging for 12 years could not come to Jesus and make this kind of request to heal her. It simply just would be frowned upon. It would not be allowed in that society. Beyond that, if she was bleeding for 12 years, Levitical laws would have made her unclean, and she couldn't touch a healer like Jesus. It would, might just make the healer unclean as well. And yet Jesus receives her touching. He receives it from her, and he says beautiful words to her. Right there on the mission to go heal Jairus' daughter, and he stops that mission to say to this woman, daughter, your faith has made you well. These are such beautiful and profound words. And once the scene ends, they move on, and they get to Jairus' house, and word has come that Jairus' daughter has died as a result of the delay. She wasn't well, and because Jesus stopped, she's died. And, and they get there, and there's weeping, and there's wailing happening inside of the house. Honestly, a 12-year-old girl dying, you could imagine that there would be weeping and wailing in that place. And when Jesus gets there, uh, he says to them, do not fear, only believe, only believe. And then he says to them, the girl is not dead, she's only asleep. And they laugh at Jesus. They laugh at Jesus when he says this to them. And then Jesus excuses a few people from the room. They move into her bedroom, and he says to the little girl, Talitha kum, which means get up, stand up. And she does, and she heals her. And the scripture says this amazing thing again. It says, and they were overcome with amazement. They were overcome with amazement. There's two sort of conversion experiences that happen in these stories, a, a transition from here to over there. When it pertains to the hemorrhaging woman, she was at the bottom of the status world, friends. She was at the bottom of the bottom. She was poor. She was destitute. She was sick. She couldn't touch people. But Jesus allows her to touch him, and she elevates her status from here to there. And she receives the status of being one of faith, one of faith. In the, the Gospel of Mark, as we've been hearing it for the past few weeks, remember how Jesus keeps telling the disciples they're those of little faith? It's so interesting. He elevates this woman to a higher status than even that of his disciples. She was over here. Now she's over there. She's become one of faith and a faith that has made her, her well. And for the people inside of Jairus' house, they go through a profound transformation as well because I don't know if you heard it, but that stuck out to me in that part of the story when, when, Jesus said, when Jesus said, she is not dead, she is just asleep, and they laughed at him. They laughed at him. Have not you ever been laughed at for your faith in your life, for the beliefs that you have? And then Jesus does his healing ministry, and they all transform over into this new reality of becoming overcome with amazement. There's this profound conversion that happens between here to here in this story. Jesus makes us well through our faith. Jesus makes us well through our faith. That part of the story when he tells that to the hemorrhaging woman that her faith has made her well, I think is really a big part of the story of what, of, of between these two contrasts, between these two realities of the conversion experience. I've been thinking this week, what does this story mean for Mark's community? What does the story mean for Mark's community? Because Mark's community has been separated from Jesus for a generation or two generations. It's been some 30 years since Jesus was in their midst. And you have to imagine that it's been 30 years, and they have not seen these kinds of miracles that they remember. These miracles like Jesus healing the hemorrhaging woman. I mean, that's a miracle. 12 years of bleeding and then being touched by Jesus, and now she's healed. A little girl dead inside of a room, and Jesus raises her up, resurrects her. That's also a miracle. And yet for Mark's community, I don't think they experience those kinds of miracles anymore. 
like the way they remembered Jesus doing them in these stories. And so what does this mean for them in the midst of these miracle stories? I think what these stories might mean for Mark's community is what he says to that hemorrhaging woman, that her faith has made her well, that her faith has made her well. The word well is the Greek word seisokin, seisokin, which is really about this place of being saved or a quality of being made well in relationship with God. Your faith has made you well. Here's what I think this means. Here's what I think this means in the midst of not experiencing miracles, because I think we live in a world in which we don't often experience miracles like this as well, especially when it pertains to medical realities in our life, like these stories with the hemorrhaging woman and, and the raising of the dead of a 12-year-old. We don't experience these miracles all the time. Here's what I think this might mean for us, is that when we have undergone this kind of transformation too, like that world over there that laughs at Jesus for their faith, but if this is the world that's overcome with amazement and we live into this faithful relationship with God, when you stand over there and you think about how faith can make you well, you just see this big canyon. You see this big canyon in between the two things because if you're like the hemorrhaging woman you want so desperately to be healed, or if you have a 12-year-old that's died, you so desperately want them to be made well and for them to be alive, you really want the end to be the thing that you want to have happen, right? That's the thing you so desperately want. And maybe in your prayer life with God, you say, God, will you please do this? But so often God doesn't answer that prayer, right, friends? Perhaps you've been in that place where you ask that prayer, God, please do this. And God doesn't often answer that prayer. And it can be so hard. But when we find ourselves in this faithful relationship with God, as one who is called daughter, your faith has made you well, I think what you can ask is, God, where are you faithful in the midst of what I am going through now? Where are you faithful in the midst of what I'm going through now? And when you begin to ask that kind of question of where are you faithful in the midst of what I'm facing, God will begin to show up in meaningful ways in your life so that there won't be just a canyon between there and here anymore, but you'll be able to see the steps where God was available to you, where God was present to you in the midst of that time. When it comes to trying to potty train my daughter, when it comes to trying to potty train my daughter, there's obviously times that are like deeply frustrating with that because <laughs> you want to get over here, right? You want to get to the end that you so desperately want to have happen. Yet I find myself even in my prayer life with that going, God, where are you faithful in the midst of me parenting this child? Where are you faithful in the midst of me parenting this child and how can I be a more loving parent? Can you show me that in my prayer life? Can you show me that? God answers that prayer all the time, friends. And maybe God might even provide some great resources to help you through that journey. Maybe you find yourself a bit like the hemorrhaging woman that's been bleeding for 12 years. Maybe you have a medical reality that you're facing that you just have not been able to figure out yet. And you, maybe you feel like the hemorrhaging woman too in the sense that like you've been to doctor after doctor after doctor Maybe you've received a medical bill for thousands of dollars and you're going into debt, you're going into debt, you haven't figured this out, this thing is so frustrating, I so desperately want to be healed, I so desperately want this miracle to take place in the midst of my life. Maybe you're on Medicare and you know that in the next month, to get the right kinds of things you need, you're gonna have to spend 50 hours a week on the phone, you know, calling people here, there, it can be so frustrating, making your way through these medical systems sometimes to get the care that you deserve, the treatment you need. And in the midst of that, I know our prayer is, I want this. We may not get that, but our prayer can be, God, where are you faithful in the midst of this? In the midst of this prayer, I think we might just hear Jesus say, Jesus, Jesus will say to us, daughter, son, your faith has made you well. I will show up and be faithful in the midst of this and be present in your life. And that wellness, that, that status of being saved will, will strengthen you and encourage you for that 50 hours of phone calls to keep fighting, to keep working, to, to get the kind of treatment that you deserve, that you desire. And there will be some kind of enriched quality of knowing God's faithfulness in your life and entering into this trusting relationship with God, no doubt, no doubt. 
five years ago when I started out ministry here at Trinity, um, I was introduced right away to one of our members at the time, Paul Kalanithi. Uh, people said, you should go talk to Paul. Paul loves philosophy of science. You guys would have a great time together. And, and we did. We had some really great conversations together. And I met him at his house, and we had this wonderful time together. And, and when we left that time, I, I asked him, how can I pray for you, Paul? Paul was diagnosed with terminal lung cancer five years ago, and it was very clear where his journey was headed in the next few months. And his request for prayer was that he might be strong enough to come to worship one more time to receive communion on a Sunday. And I was happy to pray for him in that way, and, and he did. He came the next Sunday to worship, and he got to come to worship one more time to receive communion, and it was a beautiful moment. A few weeks after that, Paul's... Paul's lung cancer got much worse and much worse, and he was in the hospital for a couple of days, and it was becoming really clear that this was going to be the end of his life. And it was sometime in the morning, Pastor Mary let me know about it. Pastor Mary went to the hospital for three hours to go see the family and see Paul, and then I went to Stanford to see him for a few hours, and I went home, Pastor Mary came back for a few more hours, and then in the evening, I went back at like six o'clock, and I just stayed there for a few hours with the family in the room. And all that time, there's people coming in and out. Paul was a doctor at Stanford, so all of his colleagues were coming in and out of the room, saying their goodbyes to Paul, just being with him. His family was there. His daughter was there. And all the while, I was just in the room, sort of as a strange person in the space, being a pastor. And, and I was there for the last moment when Paul took his last breath. And all the while, obviously, there was weeping and wailing taking place in that space, but Paul's father reached over to me when it happened, and he just said, Pastor, will you lead us in prayer? And we all held hands together, laid hands on Paul in that moment, and though the end did not happen that they had hoped for, that he might be, that he might be healed from his disease, there was a quality of faithfulness present in that room in the midst of our prayer together, and are holding each other and are loving each other, that God's love was made so powerfully known in that space. There was a wellness. There was truly a wellness in that room. Jesus makes us well through faith, through God's faithfulness to us and embracing in our faithful response to God this trusting, deep relationship with God. We may not get the ends that we have, but we can entrust ourselves and our lives to God and say, God, where are you faithful in the midst of this? And God will show up. God will show up in this journey of our life, friends. These stories can be pretty hard because I think we want the miracle. We may not get the miracle, but we will get God's faithfulness made known to us. And in doing so, we will be made well. Jesus said to that woman, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Go in peace. Will you join me in a word of prayer? God, may we know that wellness. May we know your faithfulness in our life, especially as it pertains to some of these health things that we try to do the best that we can in our life. We know, God, we may not always receive miracle, but we, we entrust to you as our lives and our prayer lives and our faith. And God, may you be made known in the midst of our journey. Could we know your faithfulness and could we take on a kind of wellness as a result of that, a strength to face what we need to face? Lord, we give you thanks for all that you are and how you love us and how you're present in our lives. And we lift this up to you and we pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, amen. Brothers and sisters, we rise in body or spirit as we sing our God together.
offering in a moment and it is our unique calling as a church to be investing in the work of faith increasing our faith faith in Jesus Christ who makes us well all things well but there's been a lot of giving going on this week uh, we use the word epic for a lot of things and it doesn't always apply but as regards our garage sale and what happened this last week it was epic it's an epic effort uh, to organize and sort and sell and then make sure everything's cleaned up so we can be in worship today. It's pretty unbelievable. How many of you helped in some way in the garage sale this last week? A lot of you. A lot of you. Bless you. Thank you for that. And I want Drew to come on up and tell us how we did since it's a fundraiser for our Youth Mexico mission trip, which happens over spring break. quite epic not to use the overuse the metaphor or analogy of, of a chasm but you know when we first start this you know we never know how much we're going to get and then we get a huge amount right <laughs> more than more than we could possibly sell and uh and uh we get some strange things like you know that costume that kurt uh <laughs> modeled it did find a really good home. I'm not going to embarrass the person who bought it, but it did find a good home. It will be used well. Um, so just tons of hands went into it. So thanks, thanks for everyone who helped. Thanks for Annette and Alicia, who just did yeah. a, an amazing job coordinating. They, they not only have to coordinate the sale and the prices and, and all that stuff, but they also have to coordinate. We, we end up with a lot of stuff at the end of the sale. I mean, really, truly, we don't, we don't sell it. There's so much generosity that comes in, and they, they have to tirelessly find places that will take it. Like Family Tree came and took a bunch of stuff after the sale was over. We loaded up, I don't know if you saw the, the, the U-Haul, we loaded up the U-Haul with stuff that was left over. We loaded up a trailer equally the size of that, and we took that down to Savers to, to, to give it away. And even, even with all that, we, there's stuff that Savers wouldn't take. So that's why we have the dumpster. But um, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but anyway, it was just it was an amazing, amazing sale. So we ended up, for the, for the 51 students who are going on the trip this year, which is absolutely amazing, um, we still need some more advisors, um, we raised over almost $19,000 in the sale. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you because you're investing in a life-changing experience for everyone that goes on this mission trip. But I also want you to know that we have a local mission trip coming up at the end of this month that is fairly epic as well. Because we have people, uh, a community of folks um, near Fair Oaks uh, that are ministered to by St. Francis Center and Siena Center. Unbelievable. So we're bringing up a professor from UCLA, Professor Robert Chow Romero, to lift up the spiritual richness of this community and give us the chance to actually go there on the weekend of February 21st through 23rd. Please notice all the information that is out about that between 4 and 7 on Saturday. We hope most of you will be there to enjoy this local mission trip. Let's give now to the work of Jesus Christ in the world as the ushers come forward for our offering. You're the one who walked on water and you calm the raging seas you command the highest mountains to fall upon their knees you're the one who welcomes sinners and you open blinded eyes you restored the brokenhearted and you brought the dead to life forgetting all our sins Remember all your promises. You are amazing, more than amazing. Forever, our God, you're more than. authority you've spoken and you set the captive free you're the king who came to serve and you're the God who washed our feet you're the one who took our burdens and you bled upon the cross in your kindness and your mercy you became a way for us Forgetting all our sins, you remember all your promises. You are amazing, more than amazing. Forever. 
At the end of that story in Mark chapter 5, after Jesus says to that little girl, Talitha kum, get up. He says to her and to the people in the room to give her something to eat, to give her something to eat, to carry on in the journey. May what we eat today be God's faithfulness to us, and may we receive that for the strength in our journey. The table in front of us is the Lord's table. It's Jesus' table, and Jesus invites everyone who trusts in him or wants to trust in him to come to this meal that he has prepared for all of us. Let's pray. Holy God, Father almighty and creator of heaven and earth, with joy we praise you and give thanks to your name. For great and wonderful are your works. Your ways are just and true. Therefore, we lift our hearts in joyful praise as we come to this table, joining our voices with choirs of angels, with all the faithful of every time and place who are forever singing to the glory of your name, holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We praise you, most holy God, for sending your only son to live among us, sharing our joy and our sorrow. He told your story. He healed the sick. He was a friend of sinners. And then obeying you, he took up his cross and died that we might live. We praise you that he overcame death and is risen to rule the world, that he is still the friend of sinners. We trust him to overcome every power that can hurt or divide us and believe that when he comes in glory, we will celebrate victory with him. Gracious God, we ask now that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and the fruit of the vine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Send us out in the power of the Spirit to live for others as Christ to live for us announcing his death for the sins of the world and telling his resurrection to all people, all nations. By your spirit, draw us together into one body and join us to Christ the Lord that we may remain and be his glad and faithful people until we feast with him in glory. So through Christ and with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, forever and ever. Amen. On the night that Jesus was arrested, he took bread. And after he gave thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat this, do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup from the table after supper. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood poured out for the sins of the world. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death and resurrection until he comes again. Soon you will be invited to come forward, beginning at the back of the sanctuary, excused by the ushers. You can come forward and take a piece of the bread. There will be gluten-free at the station where I'm serving. Take a piece of the bread and dip it into the cup and then return on the other side of your row. If you come carrying burdens this day and you would like someone to pray with you and for you, you can go to one of the prayer stations that are by the screens. Uh, there are people there waiting to listen in confidence and to pray with you. Let us receive now the faith, the healing, the wholeness of Jesus Christ in this sacrament. Will those who are serving please come forward at this time?
by your spirit as we sing our concluding song this morning. Let's sing. faithfulness we are made well and as a result of that ministry may we all be overcome with amazement like those people gathered in that room that day may we bring that amazement into the world around us knowing that God is faithful to us may we be made well and go in peace and now receive this benediction may the Lord bless you and keep you may the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. And life is one, the living just because.